Hi. Uh, my name's Tyler. I also work at Scribd. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about alternative data structures in Ruby. Um, despite what Tim said, I don't actually know anything about uh, NoSQL, so I'm not going to talk about that. So instead, I'm going to talk about So, um, now you might be asking yourself, you know, why should we talk about different data structures? Like, you have your arrays, you have your sets, you have your hashes. Great, that's enough for anybody, right? Well, um, sometimes that's enough, but uh, sometimes you need to do something a little bit different. Um, so again, at Scribd, like, we deal with a huge amount of data, and so uh, on lots of occurrences, I've found that, like, uh, the normal data structures that you use on a daily basis just don't always quite work. They don't do... Um, they don't do exactly what I want all the time. So, uh, you know, why would I use a different data structure? Well, there's basically three different reasons. There's speed, there's memory, and there's clarity. Um, so, uh, let's get into that a little bit more. So, you know, you know what? Uh, you might, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, so what's wrong with my favorite data structure? X, whatever X is. Well, probably nothing. Um, the, uh, the things I'm gonna be talking about are just data structures that I've used in the past um, and, you know, also currently, and it's just data structures that I find interesting. The, talk, the point of this talk isn't really to like say, you should use these data structures. It's more like, uh, you should use data structures in general um, and to get you more interested in them. So, all right, let's get right into it. Uh, let's talk about bloom filters. Uh, so the point of a bloom filter is to test for existence in a set. It's basically to say, have I seen this item before? Um, it's a probabilistic data structure, which means it can fail sometimes. And you know how much it fails and how often it fails, um, that's a tunable thing, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but really, the point of a bloom filter is uh, its memory usage. Uh, it's pretty awesome. So let's say that we have 100 million strings. Let's say they're about 100 characters long. If you were to put these in a traditional set, you'd be talking something like 10 gigabytes of memory. So not really feasible. More memory than most computers have right now. Uh, in a bloom filter, if you thought that like a 0.00001% chance of failure is okay, you could do the same thing in about 280 megs. Um, if a higher failure chance is okay, you could do the same thing in 170 megs. So these are much more reasonable numbers. So how does a bloom filter work? Well, a bloom filter is basically just a series of bits, a series of checkboxes, which can be on or off. Um, you know, they're indexed, of course. And so if we want to say, uh, here is my string, here is my object that I'm adding to my set. You know, maybe it's the string to be or not to be. First, we run that through a series of hash functions. Now, exactly how many hash functions you use is a function of how many things you're gonna be adding in the size of the bloom filter, but for now, let's just say we're gonna use two. And so we run it through two hash functions and what pops out are two numbers, one and five, let's say. So we set numbers one and five, great. Then we're gonna add another one. We're gonna add that is the question. And mind you, like an eight bit bloom filter is not actually something you would want to use. Uh, so, <laughs> so there is that. But uh, so we're going to add that as well. And then we're going to start a query, whether it is nobler. Well, so then we run that through the same two hash functions and out pops two numbers, two and five. And one of those is not set. So we definitely have never seen this string before. Uh, likewise, we go back to the to be or not to be, run it through two hash functions, one and five, and it's a match. Great. Well, we can also get one that will give a false match. Now, we didn't actually see this one, but the two things that it happened to get uh, just happened to be set, so it's a false match. And like I said, this, this can be tuned just based on the size of the bloom filter, so uh, that is what makes it probabilistic. So what is the point of a bloom filter then? Well, let's say we're running something like a, a file server, some file server that uh, lives remotely, has lots of files on it, it's kind of expensive for us to query it. Well, let's say our architecture looks something like that. Um, so we have a request that comes in, it goes directly to the file server. If it exists, it sends 200 back. If it doesn't exist, we send 404. Great. So maybe we find that uh, we're getting a lot of 404s. People are querying this like a lot. And you know, our file server is becoming overloaded. Great, we need to find something to do instead of this. Well, one thing we could do is add a bloom filter in between the request and the file server itself. Um, and the point of this would be to just say, what is not in the file server. We can't actually say what is in the file server, we can say if something definitely is not. And so in this case, 
even if the loom filter uh, gives us a false match, great, so we let that request through and the file server is just going to return a 404 anyway. Uh, and so that's fine, but we still get rid of like 99% of the, of the false requests to the file server, which is great. So summing up loom filters, uh, point is testing for existence in a set. Uh, really the, uh, the reason you would use this is for its memory footprint and you know, it also has a great speed. So that's loom filters. So let's move on to uh, BK trees. All right, BK trees stands for uh, Burkhard Keller trees, which is just the, the guys who invented it. Um, what it actually does, though, is somewhat more interesting. It finds the best match even when, a, uh, even when an exact match does not exist in a set. Um, and the point of this is to reduce search space. Tr traditionally, if you wanted to find the best match in a particular set of strings, let's say, you would have to scan through the entire length of strings you know, maybe use a priority queue to like keep the ones that are closest to what you're looking for. But the point of a BK tree is to make it, make it so that you don't have to actually scan through the entire list. Uh, so really the point, the point is that it reduces the search space. And it only works inside something called a metric space. So what is a metric space? Well, the term metric space comes from, uh, well, traditionally comes from like Euclidean distance, like actual distance between two points. Um, but it turns out that Levenstein distance also counts as a metric space. And so traditionally, uh, BK trees are used for spelling correctors um, in order to find the best matches for a particular word in a large dictionary. So uh, what this works off of is something called the triangle inequality, which I added this slide to my talk and I'm like, wow, this is, is going to be good. Any talk with triangle inequality in it, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> so let's say we have these three nodes, X, Y, and Z, and we know the distance between two of the nodes, one and four. Uh, and technically this is the reverse triangle inequality, but um, the point really is that using that we can determine, we can determine a, 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 a lower bound for the distance between z and y. So we just plug in the numbers into our formula, 4 minus 1, and so we can say that the distance between z and y is greater than or equal to 3. And so if, we, if all we cared about was the distance, uh, if all we cared about was uh, if the distance between them was less than two, now we don't even need to run that distance function. Now we can just skip it. So uh, let's take a look at an actual example of this. So let's say this is our dictionary. We have six words there, taser, paste, shave, light, pasta, and pasta. And uh, so to start building our BK tree, we're gonna pick one of the words on there, totally at random. Completely at random, let's say it's paste. Um, so we're gonna build a tree. And it just so happens, of course, that our, uh, our tree works out perfectly. And uh, paste is the root, and pasta is one distance. It's one edit distance away from paste. Pastor is two edit distance. Taser is three edit distance, et cetera, uh, going down the line there. So now we want to query it. We're going to say, you know, our user has typed in a particular word. Let's say it's pasta, but they spelled it wrong, so it's pastu. So now we want to find the words that are closest to this in our tree. So we compare it to the root, we run our distance function, and great, it's one. But, you know, so what do we do to get the rest of them? Well, using that triangle inequality, we can determine that only two of the words on there, or only two of the branches off of the root, are actually even feasible, uh, given the triangle inequality, given that um, the, we know the distance between pastu and, past and paste, and we know the distance between paste and pasta and paste and pasta, we can say that um, only those two are actually interesting. So we can just get rid of all the other ones. Uh, so now it turns out that pasta and paste are the only ones that actually match. They're the only ones that are interesting to us. But really the point of this is that we got to not do our comparison across everything else. Uh, you know, taser, shave, and light did not even have to run this distance function. So here we got rid of 50% of the queries that we would have had to do previously. And uh, so extending the BK tree, you know, maybe we have lots of words here. And you can kind of see, you know, maybe we take that pasta, compare it to paste, and it turns out, you know, pasta and pasta, and each of those, like continuing down the line, we only end up having to query a very small percentage of the tree, uh, which is fantastic. So, uh, summing up BK trees, you know, most often these are used for spelling correctors, but you could also use a BK tree for something like finding everything that's particularly close to something on a map, for instance. You could use it for that as well. Uh, you know, it works in any metric space, but it only works in metric spaces. And the point is to reduce the search space, to reduce the number of uh, functions that you have to run. So, all right, that about covers it for BK trees. So let's move on to another one. It's called a splay tree. Uh, so before I get into splay trees, uh, I'm going to go off on a little tangent here about access patterns. 
Um, so normally when people think about data structures, they're like, well, you know, I'm going to query these different keys, and you know, they kind of assume that it's going to be an even distribution between the different keys that you're going to be querying. I, I do this myself a lot. But it, it turns out that you know, that's actually very rarely the case. Um, normally, uh, the, the actual like, querying that you do against that data structure is going to look a lot more like a power law. Uh, for instance, like, a lot of the work I end up doing is in text analysis. And in text analysis, there's something known as Zipf's law, which states that you know, basically in any human natural language, you're going to have a power law of words. So um, that kind of applies especially to splay trees because uh, splay trees uh, are such that like, the more uneven the access pattern, the better. So like, you, I'm sure you can find some like, immediate uses for this. How about like, web caches? Especially web caches for something like involving uh, uh, time data. So for instance, you, you have a blog, a very popular blog. And let's say you know, most of the traffic that you currently get are going to your latest blog post. So a splay tree would be perfect you know, if uh, memcache wasn't good enough or something like that. But you know, anyway, so splay tree is a self-balancing binary tree. And the point of it is that it brings the most accessed items closer to the root. So you know, maybe you have your binary tree. Look something like this, perfect little binary tree. Great. So now we're going to query for uh, number nine. So what happens? We, get, well, we walk down our tree there to number nine. And then we do what's called a splay operation. We start doing tree rotations until 9 gets back to the root. Uh, now, you might be saying to yourself, well, we had this perfect binary tree before. Why would you want to do that? You know, why, why would I want this now like extremely unbalanced binary tree? Well, it, the point of this is to get the most accessed items toward the root of the tree. Uh, and so you know, maybe you know, so the next time that 9 is queried, it's going to come up immediately. No delay at all. Great. Um, now, of course, you know, if 5 is queried, it's going to have to walk all the way down there and then like rotate it back up to the top. But the idea is that this is especially good for, uh, for queries that have extremely uneven access patterns. So display trees, made for very uneven access patterns, great for caches, garbage collectors, et cetera. Um, again, like this isn't actually something that you're probably going to use on a daily basis, but it's kind of cool to know about these kinds of things and get you interested in like different data structures so you can find something that does work for your situation. Now we're going to move on to tries. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, in a, like in a traditional display tree, you would do it on every access. Like I said, this is for like extremely uneven access patterns, and I have some benchmarks that actually work out to a uh, to show that you know, in, in very uneven access patterns, it works out to be quite a bit faster than a hash table, it turns out. Yeah. You, know, you move it all the way to the root each time. Seems kind of weird, but it turns out that it works sometimes. <laughs> so uh, last data structure we're going to look at is, uh, is a try. This is actually my favorite data structure, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, so why is a try cool? Well, it turns out that it has order one lookup has order one add, has order one removal. You can do order traversals. You can do prefix matching. Basically, it's like a hash table, except better in every way. Um, I, that's not actually true, but you know, anyway. <laughs> uh, and then depending on the implementation of it, you can have really good memory usage. Um, so that's also awesome. So how does a try work? And what does a try do? So this is what an empty try looks like. Just has a root node. Uh, so now we're going to add a tr we're going to add a string to it. We're going to add the string thin. And so we just add four little nodes there, one following the other, thin. And we're going to add another one, trap. And so you can start to see there, like, we're starting to share, like, the, uh, the upper nodes. So trap and thin both share the T. And we add another one. We're going to add bar. And we add burp. And uh, so you can see there, like, the, the, the point is that it, it starts, like, it, um, as you build the tree, they start to share more and more of the individual tree, of the individual nodes, rather. So how's the query work? Well, let's say we're going to query for trap. Start at the root node. We walk down each letter at a time. T, R, A, B. And success. You know, we found trap. And let's say we're going to do uh, a false query, something that's not in there. It's going to look like this. You're going to start at the root node. B, U, and fail. So it stops there. You know, um, basically, like the the P in Buckus isn't there. So that's as far as we go, and we know that it's not in the try at all. So here's an example of where a try is pretty cool. 
um, as an autocompleter. Let's say you're going to make a, a rack, a rack-based autocompleter. Well, it turns out that you can do that with most tries in just like that. Um, so you can see there we have our initialize method, which loads a whole bunch of words into the try, and in our call method to uh, match the rack API, uh, we do a rack request new on the environment. We get our word, um, which I apparently forgot to put into a variable. That's cool. Um, and then we return it. Yeah, so we're just going to return the list of uh, children of a particular prefix to JSON. And that's really it. Like, uh, tries are pretty cool for that. So it looks like I'm ending incredibly early. Uh, apparently, I've been talking really fast. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, but really, my conclusion is pretty simple. Like, data structures are cool. Um, you know, maybe you won't find any particular use in these data structures, but uh, hopefully, the, uh, hopefully this will kind of get you interested to look at other data structures and find something that is interesting and does work for you. So uh, hopefully you guys have lots of questions. Uh. So the idea with the bloom filter is to not rely on it being correct 100% of the time, which is kind of which is why I like the file server example there, um, because even if it is wrong, like it's just going to pass through and still get the correct answer. So really, the point is to just use it as a filter, uh, like expect false positives. Exactly, you will never get false negatives. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> How do I do it? Uh, I work with a bunch of really smart people and I ask them generally. <laughs> um, so, huh. Another way to do it. I don't know. I spend a lot of time on Wikipedia as well, just like reading about different data structures and reading books. And uh, Mark is holding up something that I cannot read. Right. Oh, yes, exactly. <laughs> nice. Anything else? I'm sorry, can you say it again? Oh, Burkhard Keller is a, is a paper written in 1972 by a guy named Burkhard and a guy named Keller. <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, um, that, that autocompleter example, like, that's actually what our autocompleter looks like for tags. It's great. It's really very simple. Um, additionally, uh, like, I have... I've been working on a, a spelling corrector for the search engine that we use at Scribd, um, so I'm using a BK tree for that. Uh, I haven't actually used splay trees, but I know several other people who work on uh, some graphics-related stuff at Scribd have. So, uh, yeah. Ah, I should have added a slide for that for different links. Um, so I have a couple implementations uh, in C with Ruby bindings on my GitHub, github.com slash Tyler. Um, but then there's also uh, a few other ones if you just search, really if you just search like GitHub or uh, Google for like Ruby splay tree or Ruby BK tree, you'll, you'll find quite a few good hits there. Um, so we use it for a couple different things, um, but uh, the main thing is uh, tags. So we have a tag autocompleter. As you start typing a tag, it'll figure out which one you actually want. Pretty simple. Exactly, keeps it out of the Rails app, so that, you know, really quick, really quick response times. Anything else? All right, sorry, I'm ending so early, guys, but. <laughs>